Welcome to the Secret Sun Video Mystery Hour. We have a returning guest, Mr. Wayne Mathias, who since we last talked has created a new Substack blog called The Open Sanctum. Now, Wayne's got a lot on his mind. He's got a lot of things that all of you are interested in that we've discussed uh, at length in many different live streams and such. Uh, Wayne has a little bit different take on it, and we're going to talk about transhumanism and science fiction and the overarching agenda of the last century. So, uh, Wayne, say hello to everyone out there. Hi, it's good to be back. It's good to be back. So, Wayne left me a list of notes, and I just want to sort of go through this just so we can get a sense of the lay of the land here. Uh, key topics, transhumanism, science fiction, the world of tomorrow, techno-utopia, cyberpunk dystopia, which we're kind of living in now, right? Mm. Fembots, <laughs> fembots, <laughs> cyborgs, and AI, robosexuality, dehumanization, all those uh, very trenchant topics. Humanity 2.0, the new apple of knowledge. Escapism 2.0, alt-reality tech. Uh, and this is not on the official menu, but I'm just going to bring these up because it's just going to give us a little bit more context of our discussion here. AAT, ancient astronaut theory, watcher cults, the new world religions with powers and principalities. Supernatural Easter eggs. Materialist minions getting in over their heads. Useful idiots for extra-dimensional predators. Something <laughs> Secret Sun uh, <laughs> members are well familiar with, right? Innocents or dupes getting brain-jacked or soul-hacked. Hmm, very interesting. The techno-mage, the post-human occult boss, wielding both kinds of magic. Also, his appraisal of the sci-fi genre's deficiencies, lack of emotional intelligence. Very, very true. Especially the classic guys, you know, people like uh, Arthur C. Clarke and um, Zelzany and Isaac Asimov. Uh, their, their characters were just basically cardboard cutouts, weren't they? Uh, Wayne, do you agree with that or disagree with that? Yeah, I believe it has improved quite a bit in the last few decades, uh, especially as more women have entered the field. And uh, so I'm optimistic that this is improving. Okay. Uh, Scientism as the default worldview, the deliberate exclusion of a spiritual dimension with the exception of the dark side. Yes, sir. Um, so that's pretty much it's the plenty, context yeah, of say. the work that you're dealing with, Wayne. Um, yeah, well, you just wrote a book about your uh, take on the comics world, and I'm, yes. I'm actually I ordered it and it should arrive next week. I'm looking forward to this. So, uh, by the way, did you self-publish or did you have a publisher? Uh, to, I do through uh, Kindle. So, yeah, uh, did you have to print up a bunch of copies and you got boxes? Of no, them it's all <laughs> no, no. I, I actually don't have any copies right now. Um, I ordered some yeah. and I haven't gotten them yet. Um, okay. They don't like. Amazon doesn't like you um, selling your author's copies at a at a uh, oh, okay. discount or at a you know at a profit. Yeah. They um, yeah. and actually, I have found that the author's copies, if you order them in large amounts, they will sort of send it to the uh, uh -huh. let's just say the lesser skilled uh, bookmakers, uh -huh. so to speak. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I. Uh, in any case, I'm glad you, you got it out, man. And I think that, uh, you know, for all I know, you will find out whether there's some parallels between the perceptions you have of the comics uh, world as it was, as it is now, and science fiction in general. Where, well, I, I think the two are very intimately linked. I, I don't think yeah. you can separate them. Um, comic mm -hmm. books, superheroes are essentially science fiction based. I yeah. wrote about in Our Gods Were Spandex how they were originally more spiritual or esoteric or occult based, and then they became uh, much more scientific in the, in the late 50s. Mm. So I, I think that the crossover between science fiction and superheroes is immense. And then actually, most of the topics that you 
had sent me in this in the notes here uh, the ones that i just read uh i talk about quite a bit yeah <laughs> in, yeah uh, the spandex files as well as our gods with spandex and of course in um the endless american midnight i mean all these things are very trenchant and mm. uh very timely i would say and i think one of the things that i would like to ask you and just sort of start this ball rolling is that i feel that science fiction has given us a distorted expectation of science and technology, but also reality. That we have been so immersed in science fiction, you know, particularly for the past 40 years since Star Wars and Empire Strikes Back really changed the game. Um, we've been so immersed in this stuff that it's completely distorted our expectations of reality. And I'll just give you just one quick example before I you know, hand you the mic. Mm -hmm. I was watching the movie The Abyss, okay, from 1989, James Cameron. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I did not realize, because ho these Hollywood fantasies make these just complete physics defying unrealities so believable, is that one thing I didn't realize is that these undersea habitats that they were depicting in that film don't exist. Mm -hmm. There's nothing like that. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, there are mm -hmm. like, very small undersea habitats but there's nothing like these you know giant space stations uh mm. under the ocean and and they really can't be because of um the pressure you know the the pressure uh particularly in the deep ocean so what do you think of this i mean do you feel that science fiction has completely given us a distorted sense of reality and do you feel that a lot of the assumptions of the technocracy are adding to these problems? I mean, you're yeah. right there in the belly of the beast. You're right there in San Francisco. And we're seeing yes. the failure of the technocracy <laughs> on a daily yeah. basis. Yeah, well, this is also definitely a hotbed of transhumanism because a lot of them are true believers. Mm. And uh, they're, they're really quite okay with disregarding the deterioration going on around them because they s believe that they'll just, you know, MacGyver their way out of this. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. And it's like, you know, and it's like, the can, in order to have a, a civilization worth living in, there you really do have to be certain basic conditions met. And right. you cannot just swan around on the superstructure mm -hmm. and ignore what's going on deep in the engine room and in the you know in the in the lower decks where all the real work is happening, mm. and this is one of the it's, it has to do I think with this disconnect between the upper layers and the lower you know of our society, and that's that's actually a really that is kind of like the twenty first century version of the uh, the dis the disconnect between uh, in, you know the owners of industry and the workers in the factories, which. You know, there, there, that example is actually in one of the earliest science fiction films, Metropolis. Right. Which, uh, yeah, I hope everyone is familiar because that's like one of the classics and it really does anticipate Holds so much of what's well. happening. Yeah. I mean, when you see it now and see the images, you go, holy cow, that was prophetic. Yeah. It's like, yeah. how did they know? And it's like, you know, I mean, it has it has some really kind of biblical uh, spooky mythological elements too. If you just know the the Moloch machine, you know yeah. the, the the factory, which is like has this devouring the workers, you know, and uh, and the robot who is the horror you know, Babylon robot, the horror Babylon bot, yeah. And it's like and uh, the whole notion that you know you're you can actually remake reality. Right. Just by the sh sheer brilliance, you know, you see is the Promethean fire or the Luciferian fire, whatever you want to call it. And mm. there are there are no gods to stop you. So go for it. Why not? Mm. And and it's like the, the, there is a kind of like the, the both the necessity and the arrogance combine. And it's like, oh, God, this is not going to end well. It usually doesn't for except in H.G. Wells stories, which is kind of. If we look at back the, if we want to talk about the history of sci-fi and transhumanism, it really does start around that 
um, early 20th century period mm -hmm. where when you had people like uh, Jules Verne and H.G. Wells is like the mm -hmm. first wave. Mm -hmm. And and Julian Huxley and Ados Huxley mm. were contemporaries. They were, you know, there. H. G. Wells knew these guys, and he was kind of like by that time he was kind of like uh, the elder, and and actually still optimistic. And a Fabian too. Yeah. Well, let us just say it does require a certain degree of optimism about the human race to be able to conceive of something like the world of tomorrow that gleaming city of the future. It's usually like some, some amazing, pristine looking edifice that rises up, you know, and, and with monorails. And, uh, you know, the, the, everybody has seen some version of that. And well, let me ask it, you a question. Let me just interject yeah, here. I mean, yeah, Wells, yeah. you know, was very famous, you know, the New World Order, things to come. Um, yeah. But I do remember hearing that he had just become completely disenchanted and discouraged by the outbreak of World War II, even uh -huh, though, uh -huh. even though Shape of Things to Come pro almost prophesized this kind yeah. of worldwide conflagration that uh, mm -hmm. the world is saved by the Freemasonry of science, <laughs> as he put it, right? Yeah, yeah, it was a little, yeah, a little on the nose when John Cabal shows up. You know, in his uh, with his uh, his black rubber suit, it seems that they 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 have a thing for fetish gear even back then. I don't know what it is, man, but uh, and of course they've got a plan. They've got a plan for rebuilding civilization. You know, so everybody get on board. Well, let and, me ask uh, you another question, yeah. since this, yeah, I mean he's not there now, but let's you know Elon Musk, right? Mm. Um, Elon Musk is kind of seen by some people is, you know, defying the program and free speech and all this kind of thing. Um, but then again, you know, Neuralink, right? Mm -hmm. and, yeah, yeah. You know, and the, the these fake rockets, these fake um, <laughs> Jerry Anderson Thunderbirds looking rockets, right? <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, he seems to be pretty well bought into the whole science fiction transhumanist ideal you know no matter what mm. people might sort of project onto him i mean he's still mm -hmm. down with his program that i think personally is mm. insane and unworkable but yeah. is this something in you know your experience in san francisco and i don't know how much experience you have around big tech and so on but is this yeah. something that is just kind of in the air that despite all the disappointments and and broken promises and so on, that this is still viable. I mean, yeah. Well, I would say that there's a there's a mindset of that of denial of reality. This is not anything new. I think, especially in when times seem to be desperate, people will tend to cling even more to those the the vision because the vision seems to be um, almost becomes more real than the actual circumstances and this reminds me of um this is clearly the period we're in right now is n not like the go-go years of the 1960s mm. when it, uh when we are having the space race and Go it looked like we're we're totally at the peak of our form as far as you know the superpower and the and the post-war prosperity. This is not like that. This is mm. a little the the mood is probably closer to that of um, the Germans in the middle of World War II, when the writing was on the wall and and they were still cranking out their wonder weapons, believing that if they just you know, and innovating and making newer the and better. Too. Yeah, yeah, just just dazzle them with all that techno magic and somehow they will turn the tide. And that was actually the wrong strategy. This is an example of, you know, yeah, they had some brilliant ideas which were later <laughs> appropriated by the victors after the war, but the fact is that that was actually the wrong response for mm. the situation they were in and they simply would not believe it that well let, well what do you think you about say, well let me just fast forward you know i want to yeah, just sort of build yeah. on what you just said there 
Uh -huh. um, let's fast forward to Ukraine. Okay. Uh -huh. Now everybody knows that you know drones seem to be a very active part of the combat on both sides, but really what we're seeing is almost the um, disproval of the wonder waffen, as they call them, right? That yeah. all these wonder weapons don't really live up to their hype. And what we're really seeing in Ukraine right now is like back to the Verdun, you know, back to World War I, mm. back to, it's just dig in trenches and, and lob um, artillery at each other. I mean, this, it's, it mm. almost seems like the gee whiz, whiz bang tools of warfare um i wouldn't say that they failed entirely because like i said drones are still very much a part of the active combat but mm. it seems that this whole concept of you know these godlike powers just winning wars automatically uh has been disproven on both sides and as it was mm. in iraq as it was in afghanistan mm. so do you feel is science you know that science fiction mentality that we both observe i mean is it is it adjusting for this is it adjusting for this just complete just yeah. not complete but near complete um disavowal of their strategies and their beliefs yeah i you see since we're not members of any pentagon think tanks it's not it's hard to gauge whether they're actually responding to this these new realities you know, because there is a tendency to ignore reality if it doesn't fit the model that you would like to be true. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, but they they are aware, at least there is like, there's supposedly a, a framework for, you know, people who are still rational and, and ha are not in denial to the process should involve looking at the results you know, doing a little post-mission debrief and analyze, well, what worked and what didn't? What can we do better? That's usually the process. That's how everybody kind of keeps the game progressing. And indeed, it is understood, especially in uh, conflict, um, like whether it's uh, uh, business or sports or, com you know, actual war, that it never stands still. It's understood you've got to keep upping your game. And it's just a question then of what is the game that we are supposed to be prepared, preparing ourselves for, because but, you don't yeah, want to be. I'm talking right? on a deeper level, right. though. I'm talking right. on a deeper level. You know, that's sort of mm -hmm. almost like tactics. Mm. OK, and I'm so, I'm going I'm going beyond tactics. I'm going beyond strategy to philosophy. Um, mm. You know, it's. It's so funny when I read all these people like on Twitter talking about, you know, the Russians and, and the war and stuff. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, these same people lost um, a war to to about 75,000 full time uh, goat herders, part time soldiers with with little more than um, AK-47s and Toyota pickup trucks. Yeah. You know, hi, yeah. is there. Is there a point where the fetishization and actually the deification of technology, which reaches its apotheosis through transhumanism? I mean, transhumanism mm -hmm. is almost like the summit of this. And the interesting mm -hmm. thing about mm -hmm. transhumanism as well is, you know, the transhumanist movement, as we know, it was largely financed by Mr. Jeffrey Epstein, as you well know. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I mean, do are, is there a sense, and I, you know, I understand that you're not part of a think tank and, and all that kind of thing, but you're a very intelligent person who's very observant and pays attention to these things and thinks about these things. Is there an impulse among the technocracy that, there are limits to it. There's limits to the, the power of technology to achieve all these utopian ideals or dystopian ideals, however you choose to look at it. Yeah, well, you see, this is reminding me a little bit of, you know, when an ideology hits the wall of reality, what's going to give? Mm. Rea reality is 
pretty t is kind of hard to get around. And yet people will, if they are true believers, their faith will not be shaken. And this happened with, with communism through mm -hmm. most of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. I mean, for anybody who was really paying attention, it, it was proven to be a failed ideology by the 1930s. I mean, if you hadn't figured it out by then, you really kind of needed a clue, you know what I mean? It's, mm. But, uh, and yet it kept on going. People didn't stop believing. They continued to keep, uh, you know, uh, the Soviet Union and then China uh, continued to, to continue pushing and extending their influence as far as they could. And even while their systems were failing, it's astonishing how, uh, and uh, and now it seems that uh, even though it should be on the scrap heap of history, uh, communism seems to not have gone away. It may have just mutated. Um, well, it has and, a whole new generation of admirers now. Yeah, yeah. It seems that this might be uh, one of those phenomena where people are digging through the rubble of the past looking for some kind of solution to our present day ills mm. and it's similar you may have noticed well i'm not gonna call it reactionary but there are quite a few folks who seem to be looking backwards you know looking for something that were that they some ideal past if they just turn back the clock mm. how far back do you want to turn it do you want you know like whether yeah that's uh, never gonna work <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, you could you could take your pick, you know, how, uh, like um, the whether it's um, Orthodox Christianity or uh, taking away women's right to vote. I mean, seriously, is is that going to sell? I don't think so. How far back? Maybe, maybe. How about monarchy? Shall we? Uh, There's you know, plenty just, of those. Just, plenty of monarchists. Right? Plenty yeah, of monarchists yeah. out there. Yeah, I understand. I understand that impulse. It's just that. We're in the age where, if 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 um, uh, what we um, this transhumanist thing is meant to replace all the previous ideologies, then we've got to have something better. And the the challenge, it seems to me, even you know, regardless of whether we think that um, these are the people promoting it are simply idiots or demonically possessed, it really, the fact is that. If we don't have an alternative which is original, meaning mm. we're not just we're not just um, re, you know uh, recycling something, mm -hmm. because this is this is potent stuff. It is it's like a drug. Transhumanism is like almost like a psychedelic, where you know, and and people can convince themselves. It's almost like you can. It's like when you have a cult, the cult has its own logic Once, in everybody logic, yeah it's like a it's a private reality and everybody is reinforcing each other's private reality and this is like a very difficult thing to break so the scientism if, the scientism and the transhumanism are really just cults they're powerful cults and they're cults that can sort of claim success because of the success of, of technology and science over the past hundred years or so but they're really cults. Now, as far as communism, it's it's interesting to me, and, and we're going to get back to science fiction in, in just a second, because I want to sort of reel back to that. But, mm. um, you know, communism was known as scientific socialism, right? So it's mm. it's a it's a, an ostensibly scientific program, right? But yeah. the thing that I, I often say is that you can't expect young people particularly to become enthusiastic capitalists when they've been denied access to capital. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. it's pretty, <laughs> it's a pretty grim situation. And this is where, you know, we see the revival of Star Trek. And this is where I want to sort of lean into, because mm -hmm. a lot of the ideas that you're talking about really find an expression, a popular expression, and maybe the most widely distributed expression in all the various star trek uh series and films and so on and now we see you know there's all i don't know how many people actually watch these things but there are a number of star trek series on on paramount plus and so on 
or whatever they're calling is it cbs mm. I, I don't even know what they're calling it anymore but um you know i, I don't i don't yeah. watch that stuff but how much you know society uh star trek really does present a you know for lack of a better term a socialist military dictatorship which is the federation mm. mm-hmm. and it's all geared along um scientific and transhumanistic ideas right you know even though Uh most people you know there are very few actual transhumans in star trek but how much of this do you think i mean i would say so much of what you're talking about has been promulgated by hollywood Mm -hmm. but how much of this would you chalk up to the influence of star trek and do you think that that influence is still ongoing or is it you know is it a thing of the past and how how much of all these things that we're talking about have have been discarded outside of the influence of the cult Mm. yeah well i'm since i'm like a fan of the original star trek and uh i was even flashing back on certain particular episodes which demonstrate uh transhumanist themes Mm. uh and the th- the for example, for example, I mean, well, the, the interesting thing about that, when we see things like um, AI controlling populations, mm. which is like, this is like one of those dystopian fantasies right mm. now. The the return of the archons, for instance, mm-hmm. is like one of the classics yeah. where you've got this, the beta two, uh, three society looks like they're, uh, they're, they look like they're the old west. Yeah, it looks like, uh, well, I was thinking of Westworld, actually, talking about, a par- you know, where everybody's like going through the motions of this kind of bucolic uh, 19th century life. And mm. yet, it, and then they have this freak out every now and then the red hour strikes and then they mm. go on a ramp and they go on a rampage. It's kind of like uh, Portland or something. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> or 2020, right? 2020 yeah. was our red yeah. hour, right? Yeah, yeah. And uh then they the our enterprise posse finds out that this entire population has been mind controlled mm. for like like six thousand years by an AI supercomputer called Landru. Yeah, and L- Landru, of course, was actually this like a he was like this uh, Doctor Delgado type who just had this great idea of why not just create the perfect society by mind controlling everybody and then and. Uh, and it's and you know obviously our our Fed boys decided to shut this down because uh, the Prime Directive didn't cover this type of situation, and mm. uh, so well, and that, well. Do you feel do you feel that? Um, I mean, I don't think it's a newsflash to anyone that there are certain people in in the ruling structure of this country certainly mm-hmm. that would like to have their own uh, return of the Archons scenario. Um, do you feel yeah. that could that exist outside of science fiction? I mean, yeah, and this, yeah, maybe this is where a, Neuralink comes in. Yeah, well, you no, know, it's it's now that we've had all of the science fiction supposedly warning us, then it should be a harder sell. You mm. would think that that people should already be wary of the idea of having uh, chips put in their brain, that sort of thing, and so maybe it'll have to be. If it has to be sold to us, it'll have to be under some different, in some other form, in some very different circumstances. Uh, I, you know, uh, in my blog, I went through a few scenarios uh, mm. regarding regarding supposing, like for supposing there was some way to, um, let's say, soften people up for uh, a genetic modification to their brain, for instance. Mm. And this, the technology exists. This is, uh, but it's all like in the research phase. This could be vaporware. I have to admit, you you know, your skepticism about uh, stuff that is in development, that who knows if it'll ever work, you know, like quantum computing. Did you know, you know, it's like 20 years plus of quantum computing and billions of dollars spent. And what do they have to show for it? Right. And uh, so, but I'm not going to say that n- something couldn't work because there are some things that almost certainly do work like uh 
maybe not in the way we had hoped. Like, look at the what happened in the last three years, and you can see that there are consequences to uh, genetic engineering. Mm. That's not is not a joke now. So mm. uh, you know, everybody, all my friends here in the city got the jab, and God knows I'm praying for them because I, you know, uh, growing old is hard, especially the the attrition part. That part mm. of you know lo losing people. Yeah. I'm not, you know. So mm. anyway, um, getting back to um, you know, the the whole Star Trek vision and what is possible. Actually, that is an important question philosophically and and scientifically, spiritually, because this is where I I start to express my discontent with the genre mm. in that because it is so. Brown is so its paradigm is so limited that it really kind of leaves itself vulnerable to things like, well, supposing there is a spiritual dimension, supposing there are entities beyond the range of our senses that have an interest in us and not for our not in our best interests. I'm not going to try to paint some kind of biblical type of scenario here, but I do take the possibility seriously that if we've got science fiction melding with supernatural horror, which is, that's the nearest thing to um, the spiritual dimension right now in, when you've got stuff like Stranger Things, um, where you've got these monsters from the uh, coming in from the upside down, that kind of thing, right? So- the, Well, no, let me just interject here, because I just want to just just get back to Star Trek a bit. Okay. You know, I've talked a lot about how the nine, the Council of Nine cult was mm -hmm. very much embedded into Star Trek from very early on. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that always puzzles me that Star Trek fans just don't seem to recognize is just how many of these godlike creatures or beings are part and parcel of that universe and have been since the beginning. I mean, where no man has gone before, you know what I mean? Uh, the yeah, Telosians, yeah. right? Right, um, right. The lights of Zatar. Yeah, okay? return to, to the return Q to continuum. tomorrow. Yeah, the yeah, Q yeah. Continuum. Like, I mean, right. you, you have basically a shit ton of gods running around the Star Trek universe, and people just don't even seem to recognize it. And it just leads you to mm -hmm. wonder. I've really come to see it, Star Trek, not so much as post-human or technocratic propaganda but really as um religious propaganda you know it, it's uh, it's yeah if you, if you break it down and who is always at the top of the pyramid is these discarnate entities yeah a yeah a lot of them there's a lot of mm -hmm. them you know what right I mean? right so i yeah. mean yeah what, yeah, well, what is really being said here? And is technocracy just really a guise? Is it really just a, a mask for, you know, an occult theocracy? Mm, yeah, yeah. Well, you could, yeah, there's an interesting uh, division you could make because it seems that t um, transhumanism has two faces. There's the one that is... No, better known to the public, which is where the it's all materialist. All the premises are, you know, that including the mind. What the mind is is just a byproduct of electrochemical processes in the brain, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And 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 th those are those folks are like what I would call the minions. Those are the guys who do the donkey work. The mm -hmm. people who might be running things, who actually have the money. To pay for those minions, maybe those folks have a different value system, let's say, or different cosmology. And then they might be the ones who might be more into stuff like the Watcher cult, as you've been describing. Um, and I was thinking, you know how folks have been talking lately online about, do you ever think about the Roman Empire? And well, actually, actually, I think more about Babylon I think, or Mesopotamia. <laughs> I think about both. Yeah, yeah. Well, maybe one is a transition to the other. So, you know, after Rome falls, we get Babylon or something, you know? 
But so who knows? So I, but I do think that science fiction does seem to anticipate a lot. And um, what I've, um, an intuition I had, and in fact, um, uh, Gigi Young has been saying lately, I've been listening to her online at uh, Twitter and at um, her, her videos at YouTube, that uh, uh, people seem to be conflating lately with the alien disclosure stuff. They may be conflating aliens with um, spiritual beings, mm. and that the, the confusion of the two could be the reason why transhumanism is and has gotten some traction because there and and maybe the alien stuff you know and including these rather ridiculous um, psyops that have been run right lately, it seems to be suggesting that oh yes the gods are returning, you know. They're just, uh, you know, they're waiting in the wings. I don't know what they're waiting for. Um, those, I mean, those, those yeah. psyops like the Pentagon and all this UAP nonsense. I yeah, mean, and that mummy, that, that mummy, Jesus Christ. It's like, you know, yeah, okay, we have the alien crumb cake now. Okay. Oh, that's your question. I mean, this might be a little, <laughs> you know, you might, I don't know if you're prepared to answer this question, but yeah, yeah. Can you name me a transhumanist idea or program? That has actually worked because i can't th like is, is there any transhumanist idea or device or methodology mm. that actually works i can't think of any because you know the whole idea like i am an extreme neuralink skeptic okay because mm. i've just mm -hmm. been hearing this stuff forever right yeah. i've been hearing this yeah. stuff since the 80s all right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm trying to think about, you know, because about 10 years or so ago, there was biohacking, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And people were into the whole biohacking thing. And and I'm just like, you know, most of them were ending up with these like horrific infections because of, you know, your body just doesn't accept these things, right? Yeah. I, is yeah. there, is there, and again, I mean, I, I know you might not be prepared for this question, but can you think of just offhand any transhumanist concept or idea that is actually successful? I, I I can't think of one. Yeah, that's a good one. Because uh it even though on you know it may be that there's a larger phenomenon in progress that is even bigger than transhumanism. And this is me being well, well out let's and, back you know, up before we get into yeah, that. I mean, yeah, just like just yeah, but yeah, you're right. I think that you're right. There's a lot of things that that um where you you've seen the brochure and then you see what's delivered and you see the difference between the, the promise and what you get, and you know it's like um, you know, you're waiting for the next version, and every it's always gonna and right now we I don't know aside from the uh, the thing that's disturbing perhaps and i don't want to be uh, fear mongering but it seems that where um certain types of technologies are actually uh closest to working are when they're weaponized and uh whether or not they're weaponized against other nations or against us i can't say but mm. the fact is that the fact is that darpa is like a major, major player in all of this research. The stuff that I was referring to uh, about transhumanist, uh, the brain research, for instance, that um, just like DARPA was instrumental in um, the creation of the internet and mm -hmm. everything that, and of course, they're still involved because after all, the internet is really like our surveillance system now. It's probably always been, but, uh, and you got to figure that things like genetic engineering, that really is a thing. It may not be working the way we would like it to work, especially if you would consider the mRNA vaccines. Mm. Um, but that doesn't mean that there aren't actual weapons, new, very novel, very specific weapons that really do work. And they mm. were just we're just lucky that they haven't been deployed against us. And that's mm. not just our country, okay? I'm not going to single out DARPA like they're the only player. This Everything that's happening 
is happening in multiple countries. And what that adds up to, I, I can't say that it's necessarily like a World War III scenario. Um, and personally, I would rather not have World War III. I think most people would probably agree upon that. Yeah, I think that's pretty, and, that's a given. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Because it, it's probably, you know, it would be uh, pretty nasty especially if they go beyond the conventional weapons. I mean, the conventional ones are bad enough. Yeah. Uh, the ones that are, you know, when you, when you, there's like, um, there's some guy that uh, believe there was, God, I wish it had his name handy. Um, he is a, cons called a, neuro, a neuroethicist. And one of these professional guys who is like a consultant and he talks to uh, folks at, uh, in, at, at, believe it or not, he talks to military people about, uh, you know, the the amazing things that are in the pipeline and including uh, using, you know, making the human mind the battlefield. And actually, that is a good point. You know, I mean, you could say that the on the technological side, outer space is the bad is also the battle space. But now because we've got satellites up there and they're certainly Certainly they can be targeted or they can target each other, you know, uh, whatever can completely wipe out our infrastructure up there. That's bad enough. But if the mind is actually the battlefield, then wars can be won and lost just on that level. Mm. And and that's, you know, and in a way that is the mind is also very much to, um, the the interface with us and the spiritual world. I'm never, I cannot ignore that now. It's going to be built into the, all the stories that I write. Um, well, here's, here's the thing though. You know, you mentioned yeah. DARPA. I mean, I've yeah. been following DARPA since the eighties and I just lost track of just like all the ridiculous comic book ideas that they yeah. said were, you know, right around the corner and mm -hmm. never showed up. Mm -hmm. Now there's a quote that I always go back to. And I, I remember dropping this quote in like at least 10 years ago when I started expressing my skepticism about all these uh, wonderful new technologies. And Peter Thiel, who um, he's got the, that, you know, that <laughs> frightening uh, surveillance operation with all the mega computers and stuff. And he was an early investor in like, twitter and facebook and all these kind of things but he said something that i thought was really interesting he said that we've had great luck with electrons but not mm -hmm. so much with atoms and you know mm -hmm. he had his mm -hmm. his whole quote you know we we were expecting uh dome cities on the moon and we got 140 characters instead i mean mm -hmm. what i mm -hmm. see you know, I was just watching some of these AI generated videos and stuff, which are very nightmarish, <laughs> disturbing, right? I mean, yeah, you know, yeah. The, the uncanny valley is like the size of uh, you know, yeah, really the Grand Canyon. Uh -huh. Um but it seems to me, you know, that we're still using all these old airframes from the 1960s in airplanes. I mean, the technology, airplane technology hasn't changed all that much. Um, you know, we have electric cars now, but electric cars were invented in the 1890s. <laughs> so, yeah, I, yeah, you know, uh, it just seems like we don't, we have a lot of plans and we yeah. have a lot of these gee whiz, whiz bang things on screen, but how mm -hmm. much is actually crossing over into the world of molecules and gravity and physics i mean yeah it just yeah. seems like the disconnect between what we can do on screen and what we can do in the real world is vast not only vast but it, it seems to be growing yeah yeah well that might also be uh the that dis that the distance between what is uh supposedly in development and what comes out the other end, if it ever comes out, is the reason why cyberpunk dystopia looks the way it does. Mm. You know, if you talk about, talk about that that phrase, high tech, low life, 
that might be this this uh, failure to deliver might be the reason why it looks this way. Um, and uh, um, and I've, there's certain aspects of it which almost it's almost like this uh, a, a vicious cycle where as people as people in that world, the high tech world, are focusing on the stuff that either won't work or isn't relevant, uh, then conditions continue to deteriorate around them. And then countermeasures have to be uh, created to deal with the things like the social unrest and the looting and uh, the general this malaise, because there is a genuine, I mean, you can see it everywhere. There's a malaise of our time, you know, and people and the birth rate is falling. At least I'm, at least that's, if, it, if we become like Japan, that's not a good sign. You know, if you take yeah. a look at what happened over, what's happened over there over the past few decades is like this slow motion disintegration going on. And you go under what, what happened? They were actually really successful. They were like, they had the See, world by the tail. it's technocracy though. It's tech, yeah. because look at Singapore, look at South Korea, Japan, yeah. Yeah. China. It mm -hmm. seems the more you know, technocratic and cyberpunk you become, it's like you're planting the seeds of your own destruction. You mm -hmm. know, I, I, I mm -hmm. think that, um, I don't know what it is. It, it, you know, is it because we've just become so denatured, we've so, so disconnected from, you know, the, the staff of life, you know, the ground and the air. I mean, um, I really feel that, you know, I said this today on Twitter, uh, that technocracy is a suicide pact. And that speaks mm, exactly mm. to what you're referring to. Um, mm. I mean, I don't know if other countries in, in Southeast Asia are experiencing the same thing, maybe countries that aren't as technocratically. I mean, is Vietnam having the same phenomenon? Is Cambodia having the same phenomenon? Laos? And mm. then, you know, the Philippines and Malaysia. Mm. I mean, are they all mm. experiencing this sort of demographic collapse as well or is this something that is unique to these technocratic fetishistic societies yeah i think it is it does vary according to the culture and some mm. cultures are perhaps more resistant to that the the trend the what you might call modernity mm -hmm. than others and uh although there no i wouldn't say that any of them are immune I mean, uh, I could imagine easily how even some of the, uh, you know, the the, the less developed uh, places in the South Pacific uh, might, you know, eventually um, set aside their traditional ways that were more sustainable and then get into the whole consumer thing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they could eventually, you, you know, the people who used to live in grass and, in, in, you know, in huts with dirt floors might be soon be walking around staring into their phones as mm. they're this is not, if not already if they're yeah, not yeah, already yeah exactly they might be using solar chargers to top up their batteries but still if they're if they're getting into this staring into the phone thing holy cow that's that you know and and i do have to wonder you know uh, is even though yes it is one of the things I've um, that I can't help, just given my the way my peculiar mind works, is that all of the problems that we're describing and that other people have been trying to blame upon some faction or other, and it's very often you know the left versus the right, you know, and, and or the libertarians versus the authoritarians, and I'm just thinking this is all flatland thinking. This is like two dimensional at best, mm -hmm. and what's what the real situation is requires thinking in more dimensions. You know, add at least a third dimension, and then you get the full scope of what is going on. Because that right now we cannot the paradigms that we're working within of trying to trace effects back to their causes and then address the causes. That's it's not, it seems that we're we're just not equipped to even comprehend it properly. Well, and, see, you know, I, I'm i not maybe as familiar with science fiction history yeah. as I should be, but 
I'm trying to think of a science fiction school or a science fiction writer that questions the basic assumptions of technocracy. I mean, is that, would that be the, I, you know, part of me wants to say that would be like William Gibson and that school of cyberpunk, but I, I don't think that, I mean, it shows the deleterious effects on society, but I, I wouldn't necessarily mm -hmm. say that he questions the basic assumptions of the technocratic mm -hmm. enterprise. I mean, is mm -hmm. there a school of science fiction that just basically looks at the core assumptions, not only of science fiction, but also technocracy to transhumanism, mm -hmm. on mm -hmm. and on and on scientism, and just points them out as being utterly invalid. Yeah, who would that yeah. be? I mean, I can't. Yeah. I, I'm not sure who yeah. that would be. Yeah, I think there would be some the more um, the oddballs, let's say the outliers. I don't think that there's a school necessarily of a, a subgenre uh, because that you know, like as I you know, I would say that the the outliers that have attracted my attention, and I am still trying to absorb as much more as of their work as I can. Uh, Philip K. Dick, Ursula K. Le Guin, C.S. Lewis, Doris mm -hmm. Lessing. Um, and I would include Philip Pullman, even though a lot of people would say that, you know, his dark materials is actually fantasy. And that I would say that when people try to expand their reality map to go beyond the materialist paradigm, they often get pushed into that fantasy ghetto. Mm. They're not really they're not really considered sci-fi anymore. Mm. You know, it's almost as bad as getting pushed into the faith-based ghetto mm. in terms of like being taken seriously by your peers and by the audience, because after all, if, if an audience has been cultivated for generations to think, oh, this is what real sci-fi is, then they might have a hard time uh with absorbing something that's out of, coming out of left field, like trying to uh, uh, let's say uh, appropriating uh, Christian um, biblical mythology. I'm not going to say mythology like that is untrue. I'm just saying that there are archetypes, there are stories. Mm -hmm. We can call them, and taken co collectively, we can call it mythology, and it's powerful stuff. I don't, I, I don't take any of it lightly, even if I don't consider myself Christian, um, and. Uh, the uh, uh and my goodness i don't know if uh, are you familiar with uh doris lessing's um Sh canopus and argos uh series um, no oh my oh my i'm I have to you know there's a few call outs i should make because um she, uh, doris lessing was not known as a science fiction writer she mm -hmm. had and uh in the 70s uh, she had just gotten the idea of trying something new and uh she started with this book uh, called, which is, it's the usual uh, title it's referred to is uh, Shikasta. And uh, that was almost like a, um, a, a, a mashup of ancient astronaut theory with the origin stories in the Bible. Mm. And it was such a powerful thing because nobody had ever done anything like it before. And she was still not really accepted as a, as a science fiction writer, even though I think that Shakasta is a truly brilliant book. And she then went on to write four more novels along, you know, along the same lines, expanding that world further, you know, the the Syrian experiments and mm. the marriages between, I mean, and it was including things like, um, yes, there were aliens visiting us and, there were, and of course there were factions, there was intrigues going on, and they're playing a role in our history, sometimes sometimes incarnating as humans, which I thought, again, that sounds very new agey. And I'm sure she knew that, but it was still really at the time that nobody was writing stuff like that and certainly not a reputable author. So, um, 
So that's one example. And I would say that. Uh, well, I, you um, know, I just I did yeah. think of an example while you were talking about this. And that's right, right. Um, Frank Herbert. You know, the. Dune oh, universe. OK. OK. Yes. And, yes. The, you know, the uh, the Butlerian Jihad and so on. Mm -hmm. And yeah, yeah. And another thing I was thinking about, I mean, I don't know if this would be questioning the basic assumptions of technocracy, but um, the remake of Battlestar Galactica, the second. Oh, you know, where, yeah. You know, like everything, you know, it was the Cylons. Everything, could, everything that was digital, they could invade and hack. So everything uh -huh, just became uh -huh. like super analog. Yeah. Well, right? one of the interesting, uh, well, there are, there are like these echoes you might say reverberations of themes that you, when you look at certain key pieces of uh, you know of sci-fi that make ripples, you could say, like Blade Runner, as a good example of where yes, okay, there are certain things that sound very implausible, and yet then again maybe not so not so implausible now when you look at things like if you were instead of let's say conceiving of a robot rather than made out of plastic and metal and rubber, supposing it was a biological being that was grown like the late, the late model Cylon is a biological, is a replicant, mm -hmm. they're, you know, the, 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 you know, and, and they're indistinguishable, physically indistinguishable. And then you would have to run a Voigtkamp test. How would you know the difference? Do they have souls? And I think that Blade Runner 2049 went deeper into that whole question of, well, you know, if you were to grow a human rather than have one born of, you know, uh, men and women getting together, would that being be constitutionally different inwardly, spiritually? Mm. I think that's a good question to ask. Can, can a being acquire a soul? through just living? Is it something that, uh, because, you know, there's, um, if we talk about, and I know maybe this is venturing outside of the realm of sci-fi, but if we talk about things like um, um, reincarnation or the, 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 the notion of progressing from one lifetime to the next, maybe uh, there might be a crossover. Maybe there are, you know, at some point, uh, a creature, uh, a, you know, a creature that was an animal for a while might incarnate as a human for once, and then it might be on. T it's like the next level, and they go through further progressions from there, and then who knows what happens after that? And it could be that when we look at things like um, the whole notion of transhumanism continually improving, taking control of evolution, whether it's psychological or physical. I do wonder whether this is attempting to mimic the spiritual evolution that goes on um, ordinarily from lifetime to lifetime. Um, if one looks at that, you know, takes that framework seriously. Well, let me um, ask you another question because, okay. you know, you mentioned AT, AT and so on, ancient astronaut theory. Yeah. Now, there's a sort of spin on that. Um, the whole idea. And I, I I believe it sort of comes from Hinduism that there are these ages that mankind goes through these cycles, the yugas, right? Mm -hmm. And we reach a certain level. It's almost like the myth of Sisyphus. We reach a certain level, we we get up to a certain point, and then we just fall all the way back down. And then we mm -hmm. have to get mm -hmm. all the way back up and then fall all the way back down. And it's just mm -hmm. like that's there's a certain counterpoint and it might just be as woo but mm -hmm. there's a certain counterpoint to ancient astronauts and ancient aliens and so on that says no it's like we've just this is the human race it's like it is the myth of sisyphus right mm -hmm. um one thing that i would say that i i would argue sort of bolsters that is my feeling that the smarter our machines get, the stupider we get. And that's something that is happening right now in real time, uh, If you, especially mm -hmm. if you talk to elementary school teachers. Yeah, but also yeah. the, the more powerful our machines get, the weaker we get. Now, mm -hmm. I was looking at, I, I love to look at like books from the 19th century and stuff. And I was looking at a book, like it was on engineering. 
And I was just like amazed that people would be able to like look at these diagrams and look at all this formula and stuff and make sense of it because today it would all be done on computer, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking like, we put so much faith in our machinery and our computers that they'll they'll always be there. They'll never fail. You know, uh, you hear a lot, you know, when you're talking about like Japan, right? There's this whole school of thought. Well, it's it's OK that Japan's, you know, uh, population is imploding because they'll have AI and they'll have robotics to take over all these things that people do now. And mm. I'm just like, no, no, mm. it's, you know, no, first of all, none of these things are self-sustaining. They all have to be maintained by, you know, yeah. uh uh, people very highly skilled people who understand how they work if, if yeah. we're not out of those i mean it's it's not even idi idiocracy it's it's back yeah. to like the thunderdome yeah have have you uh, seen any self-driving cars in action Chris? no oh I, I I have. Not, it's not a pretty sight though <laughs> oh i was actually uh taken by surprise one night when i was coming home from the airport and saw one of these cars start up and drive past me with nobody inside. And I saw it, you know, it was turning left and the, the steering wheel was turning by itself. And it was just the most eerie thing. And I was also thinking, there is no way I'm gonna trust my life to a car like that. No. I mean, seriously, I mean, can you, and there have been incidents, lots of them uh, documented, not just people getting run over, but, but also that they will just stop cold in the middle of the street and then what are you going to do? You're going to call for tech support. You know, you're going to be if you're the passenger and you're in a bad neighborhood, you don't want your car to stop there. You know, you know, you, what are you going to do? You're going to be yelling at the, the computer. You've got to get moving. We've got to get out of here. You know, it's like, come on. This is kind of insane, especially around here. There's, you know, lots of places you wouldn't want your car to just quit on you. And without explanation. And yeah, it's but like, how, do they, hey, how do they how do they perform you know? in like rain, fog, <laughs> snow? Yeah, yeah. Like how truly. do they perform in those environments? Yeah, that's my I know. Question. I know. It's like, uh, yeah. There. I mean, this is why the train that whole training thing has been going on for years and years and years. And I honestly don't know. Is is this just a big scam? Are they just like soaking up all this venture capital and uh, or what? Because this is yeah, a school of I mean, thought that argues that. Yeah. Well, the thing is that there was a lot of um, you know, there may be applications elsewhere where the, the stakes aren't as high. You know, it just happens that, you know, when we learned how to drive, we had to take it seriously because lives are at stake, our own and other people's. And we have skin in the game because, you know, we have feelings. We would feel pretty bad if we were responsible for an accident or, or if we were victims of an accident. Mm -hmm. computers don't have skin in the game they have they're just algorithms mm -hmm. and and it's like wow you know and by the way you know it's like i was just watching a movie the other night an oldie the demon seed do you remember this this is like uh oh yeah this is this is like julie uh, christie yeah julie christie exactly and uh you know the the uh not so um immaculate conception um donald camell Donald Camel. Yeah, um, that's right. That's right. And uh, the, um, the 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 amazing thing is that the the Proteus Four, the the villain of this piece, is a biological computer, which actually is one of those things in progress right now. Again, we don't know if it's going to pay off. It might be like uh, actually, if they ever do a remake, they should have Cronenberg uh, do it. Because that he, did you ever see Existence? You know the one with the yeah, game pod. I did. The, 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 yeah, the, the, yeah, that's. I love I love Cronenberg, <laughs> but I thought that movie was awful. Yeah, well, you know, there's a lot of movies that I I remember, and I know they're not that good, but still, they 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 do stick in the mind for some reason. Well, and, that was um, that whole era when they you know they were trying to make cyberpunk happen in Hollywood. Uh, yeah, and there yeah. was a bunch of really bad movies. Yeah. Uh, Johnny mm -hmm. Mnemonic with Keanu Reeves, <laughs> yeah. which is yeah yeah awful. I know. uh strange days with ray fines and mm -hmm. angela bass it was awful um mm -hmm. you know it just seems to me that uh it there wasn't a you know it just didn't work it didn't work on on screen um but is there an argument to be made 
is there an argument to be made that maybe sci uh, cyberpunk is the purest form of science fiction because it whether or not it questions the assumptions it shows you you know you talked about that high tech low life mm. phenomenon i mean it shows you the i would say the destruction mm. that high technology wreaks on human beings uh economically yeah. physically spiritually mm. mm -hmm. mentally you know we are getting ob ob observably stupider you know as as a as a society yeah, I don't know if you've ever yeah. seen any of those videos where, um, you know, people go to malls or whatever and just oh, ask, God, yeah. ask all these Zoomers, like, what state mm -hmm. are you living in or how many, oh, how many states are there in the United States? And I mean, just yeah. all these questions that you think a, a, a kindergartner would be able to answer and like these teenagers just have no clue. I mean... Wow. I mean, I mean, and it's even worse yeah. now. I mean, uh, mm -hmm. I don't know if you saw, I posted a video that this teacher put up on Twitter and she's talking about, she's a seventh grade teacher and she's dealing with kids who have no skills whatsoever at mm -hmm. all. Mm -hmm. They can't read, they can't write, they can't even pay attention. They can't even sit through a three minute video. I mean, their attention spans mm -hmm. have just been so destroyed. And mm -hmm. all of this can be laid at the feet of social media, smartphones. Do you feel, I mean, do you feel personally, you know, working, you know, what I was saying about the, the not necessarily the, the questioning the basic assumptions of technology, but do you feel that we are inevitably headed towards like a butlerian jihad do you think that there is going to be a mass scale revolt against high technology mm. do you think it's just we've just got to like we've got to ride this roller coaster all the way down mm. yeah well i do think about the future quite a bit and including um how much longer should i live in san francisco you know i mean some people might be surprised that i'm still here in fact but uh mm. The certainly um, plenty of other folks have been uh, ob observing and speculating about uh, the end of empire. You know, it's kind of like, OK, yeah, there's no question that as far as what we call the American empire, that has definitely peaked and we're now in the descent phase. Mm -hmm. And we, in fact, if we were. You know, if we're looking at this like, oh, maybe it'll lead to some kind of rebirth later. Well, that would be like the Solve at Coagula playbook. Mm. <laughs> and and we're definitely in the Solve phase. It's going to be a while. There's quite a bit yet to dissolve here. But uh, the... Uh, let's hope we don't have to live through the calcination phase. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that's one of the things about, okay, where in the world would I go? I mean, I, I can't even, you know, that's one of those questions. The well, thing is, that is, supposing, is San Francisco that bad? I mean, like, it's well, a beautiful it's not, city and it's got a yeah. lot. I mean, but is it, I, I've seen like, there's this guy from, I don't know if he's from Mexico or South America, and he just goes along, uh, you know, he does these videos, like all the stores here are closed, like all the stores mm -hmm. in Burbank. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. are gone you know all the mm -hmm. stores in oakland are gone all the stores in san francisco are gone i mean what we hear all these stories you know obviously sensationalized to one degree or another mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but i mean since san francisco is the crown jewel of the technocratic project i mean what is the what is yeah. the mood? like what is the feeling yeah. on the street yeah well that's a difficult one to gauge because um on the surface, every in at least where I live, things seem calm. It's mm -hmm. like uh, you know, it's, it's not like we're personally witnessing uh, the looting going on or uh, the cars being broken into. Although people do get cars broken into pretty regularly, that's it's been going on that, for a long time too. Yeah, yeah. This is now you know, it's just a question of well, is it if it's not happening near you, then it's not like it's not constantly a presence in your, it's not part of your mental landscape if you're in a nice neighborhood. If you're, however, just a few miles that away, then the situation could be look very different. And mm. certainly it's like being, 
it's like being on a on a on a cruise liner you know if you're in one of the nicer cabins up high it's a very different experience than if you're in one of the interior cabins way down on the lower decks it's, uh, mm. so if i were if i were having to move i could very well um, not be able to afford the kind of place that i have that i would consider acceptable and so it might be better to just be out further further away and i'm sure lots of folks have already had to make this calculus before me you know people have been moving out in droves and uh they i don't think that the population will uh is surging back because it requires something to, a, a, a reason to move in if you don't have a reason then a lot of places will stay empty a lot of apart you know and uh it's uh, as far as, but looking at uh, the situation, the 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 future in general, um, it's a, I consider it kind of like a fairly. The question really is: Are we looking at just an end of empire or an end of civilization? Because that's a that's the part that kind of um, makes me go, okay, if we could be, uh, and then part of the reason I'm writing the stories that I do, at least I've, you know, gotten to the, uh, the planning phase for the, for the future series is looking at the birth of the next civilization, thinking ahead, meaning not in a pes pessimistic way necessarily. I mean, yeah, there could, there would be a, this, this rather unpleasant phase in, between now and then, and that, that's the part that nobody really wants to traverse, mm -hmm. even in, in their imagination, because it looks like, supposing it looks like uh, children of men, you know, do, you saw that when that's oh, like- Oh, there already. <laughs> yeah, that was, I tell you, that was, I, I don't know if I can revisit that film. That was hard enough the first time. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, uh, um, you know, if the, if the, for some reason, the fertility rate drops to like zero, Reproduction, yeah, that really would have an effect on everybody's uh, their, their, the whole zeitgeist. And, well, you know, uh, it's funny because one thing that I've been thinking about, and I, you know, I was talking to my wife about, it, it's like, when did everybody just get so old? You know, um, hmm. we don't see a lot of younger people kind of achieving things, hmm. Hmm. or you know, outside of. TikTok influences or something, you know. I mean, we we don't see the kind of continuity where the next generation is sort of coming up and making their mark. Um, they seem very much scattered to the margins in some ways, and I I think like can can we survive this? You know, I mean, we mm -hmm. didn't have a replacement like. Like just say like rock stars, right? The last generation mm -hmm. of, of real rock stars was like thirty years ago, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, movie stars, you know? Do we do we have real movie stars anymore? Um, I remember like ten years ago watching a video of some director out in Hollywood. He says, you know, the problem is is that there are no actors that can open a film anymore like they used to be. You know, this, a lot of the same actors mm -hmm. are still around; they just can't do it anymore. Mm -hmm. So are we seeing a decline because so many of the problems that we're facing and have faced and have seen are either directly the result of the technocracy or the indirect mm -hmm. result of the technocracy. So San Francisco mm -hmm. is a great example. It's like mm -hmm. what hurt San Francisco so badly? Mm -hmm. um, working from home and e-commerce. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? That's that's mm -hmm. the story. You know, all the other things, the homelessness and the crime and all these other things almost seem to me like secondary effects of like the fact that people decided that they didn't need to go to work in downtown San Francisco anymore and were yeah. going to the stores and riding mass transit and all these things are being starved out of money because everybody's just sitting at home all the time. So this is a mm. this is perfect you know i mean this is a result of the internet yeah well there were trends that were set into motion um even before the internet or concurrently with uh, as it started up 
and that um, there was a, you know, and this could be said about the, um, the first world generally, that there was a deindustrialization where there used to be a mixed economy where you would have a, a light industrial area just uh, to the south here. And so you could have an actual working class that made things with their hands, you know, the, 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 the nitty gritty stuff that makes a society go. Mm. And uh, we had, you know, we had shipbuilding, we had uh, a coffee roaster, we had all kinds of, uh, geez, it's like it, old time San Franciscans know all of these uh, places that are now gone and they've been taken out. Some of them have been converted into office space. Mm. And then part of the problem is that this is almost like, uh, it's almost like uh, a monoculture uh, where um, people had gotten the idea that uh, you can send the manufacturing somewhere else out of sight. And instead, we can have these clean, sterile office towers and everybody working in their cubicles and uh, that you could have a thriving economy. And, uh, you know, then so San Francisco went whole hog for office space and for tourism. So you've got, and those are your, two, your main pillars. And if you remove, well, actually during the pandemic, we lost both at the same time because mm. people, you know, you, you have vacant office space. People are still having, to, someone's having to pay for that space. It's, and, it's a, and it's a money loser for a lot of companies now having, you know, everybody wants, a lot of companies just want to break their lease and get out of it because they're just, you know, if you, if you can only make people show up like three days a week, is that really worth it? You know, mm. and uh, and well, uh, Elon Musk sort of was the the leader. Yeah, yeah. you know, he and, got rid of all these um, ridiculous fake employees that didn't really right. do anything all day except for have meetings and eat snacks. Yeah, and then well, all the other companies seem to follow on. You know, they're like, oh, we can do that. We can get rid of all these people now <laughs> that don't produce yeah. anything. All right, yeah. that sounds great. Um, <laughs> yeah, well, and, well, the whole idea, though, of having having an entire uh, a huge swathe of the economy taken over by what I would call the intellectual professions is actually unbalanced. Yes. You know, because, you know, and because after knowledge all, workers. You, yeah. 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 And and like I said, that's kind of like high up on the superstructure and the more detached they are from the their connection to. You know, all of how do you actually um, live as a as a human being? You've got to have somebody who's working with the stuff of the earth. You know, whether mm. it's gro growing the food or digging up, you know, the minerals and turning them into things. Mm. You know, this has to happen somewhere, and you mm. you don't necessarily want to have it done by a country halfway around the world and shipping it in. That's not to me. That was a big big mistake. All over for all the countries that did this, because now we've got this huge imbalance where supposing you had the shipping cut off, you know, it's like being on an island. It's like, you know, we're as dependent upon that as as Hawaii is. And uh, Hawaii is an incredibly dependent place. They cannot sustain themselves if they are. It, everything has to be flown in or shipped in to maintain a first world life. And uh we're like that, except that That's we why have it's so at least, expensive there too, right? Yeah, well, we have at least, uh, you know, at least we're on the continent. So stuff that is produced here in the country, at least it's going over land. But uh, and you got the Central uh, Valley growing all the food too. Yeah, so. yeah. Well, that's that's something. So long as uh, so long as the conditions allow, it's not something that I would consider a given, like a, a sure thing. It depends upon, you know, everything depends on water here. And uh, so, but um, um, what was it? Thinking about the, yeah, well, the pandemic really took a wrecking ball to our, our, our local society here because we had, you know, people losing their jobs, businesses shutting down, people leaving in droves. And of course, people couldn't travel like they used to. So you didn't have the tourists. And so then the tourist economy gets hit. And they are still recovering. And I just go, wow, that was too much dependence on these two, you know, having just these two pillars of the economy. That was not the way to go. We should have had more 
things distributed among different kinds of activities. And um, see, this some... to me, everything that you're describing seems to be yeah. the the fatal flaw in turning all your decision making over to science fiction nerds. Hmm. Mm. You know what I mean? It's like yeah. science fiction nerds who don't really understand the way the world really works. You know that the world of dirt and blood mm. and blame you know it's like yeah 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 you know uh it's all it's and that's like when i look at somebody you know like elon musk it, it, he doesn't seem to be a person and he's not alone in this but none of these people seem to be people who have ever had privation in their lives or mm. you know been homeless mm. or gone hungry or or just had any kind of hardship and when you mm, don't have that kind mm. of hardship i mean god bless you if you haven't but if you mm. haven't had that kind of hardship you don't understand the way the world really works for most people because most yeah, people in this yeah. world experience hardship and people who are technocratic science fiction nerds see that as an obstacle to their paradise so to speak yeah yeah well there's a the, the, you could say that um uh the way that uh, culture develops especially when it's the way it's just culture is distributed in a rather uneven fashion it's not mm -hmm. as though it's not as though everybody has equal access to uh especially you know if we were talking about hollywood my God, talk about a bottleneck. There's so many brilliant people un, who are not ever going to be heard mm. because they just can't get in the door. You mm. know, and I was one of those, and you you know exactly what I'm talking about. It's like uh the most exclusive club. It's like uh and you know, yeah, they'll steal your ideas and you know, yeah, yeah. And uh kick you to the thing, curb. And, yeah, well, it's almost like it's almost like a form of flattery if they think your ideas are worth stealing. And uh, but uh <laughs> The um, the thing is, our the uh, the actual d diversity of human experience and thought is not being reflected. It's understood. And I mean, there's always like the Hollywood version, the sanitized version. And uh, I, I'm thinking about some of the in some of the indie films that I've seen where, or the the audiences at film festivals. Have you been to any? I was been I was recently at the Locarno Film Festival in Switzerland of all places and uh if I've been Switzerland to, I've, yeah I've gone to uh like screenings at the New York Film Festival like the Tribeca yeah. Film Festival. Yes, I've been to Tribeca and the interesting thing is realizing that when you are in places where the 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 audience is very affluent and sophisticated you know it's kind of like they're they're almost they're partaking of these films. Sometimes these films are made by people far, far away with a completely different frame of reference. And they're almost like they're sampling some exotic food, you know, where it's like they can then talk about it later at their uh, at their cocktail parties. And I just go, this is not you know, it's not like actually going to those places and meeting people and then living the way they live. It's really not. You cannot, sub, you know, but it's great to see a film, though. I, I At least somebody is making the effort. Um, and but does it actually. It's the strangest thing that um, it is um, culture is heavily curated. In mm. other words, at, at the level of production and distribution and then who actually goes to see what it's almost like everybody is self-selecting to be you know they've got their their niche audience that mm. goes in then science fiction as and and comic books i'm sorry to say even though i have adored some of the comic book movies in the last 20 years i uh, i think that maybe it hasn't really served us well as a cultural no, influence that's, that's what i argue in my you new know? book <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, it's uh, other people have called it a kind of infantilization, mm -hmm. uh, and that's maybe that's a little. As rough. have I. Oh, As okay. Have I. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. listen, Wayne. Um, 
This has been a great talk. We're going to do this again soon. Um, could you just tell people where to reach you uh, as far as the Open yeah. Sanctum is concerned? Yeah, yeah. That Well, um, Open Sanctum uh, at uh, Substack is, uh, is it's uh, fairly easy to find because uh, let me take a look at the, uh, the URL here. Yeah, Open Sanctum is one word. Okay. Dot substa dot substack dot com. Great. That's it. So yeah, uh, and definitely go check that out. Um, Wayne has a lot of uh, a lot of material that I think, you know, my readers are going to be extremely interested in. Well, and, it's uh, a great thing that I'm glad uh, folks are out there who are interested, and I I'm very grateful for uh, anyone who spends time listening uh, and uh, reading our, my stuff because. Goodness knows, time is precious, and yes, it it, is. At, at, attention is the coin of the realm. Now, I mean, goodness knows, our can you imagine all the things that are competing for our eyeballs all day mm. long? It is like okay, you have really given us a great gift here to actually give a you know. I know. I hope that um, I've made it worth your while. Oh, it's this, been great. And we're going to do this lot, again. You know? uh, just okay. let people know, we were going to, you know, Wayne was um, very kind to put together this rather massive slideshow. <laughs> and unfortunately, uh, me being um, a dimwit, I guess, I couldn't really figure out a way to get uh, get it on screen on Zoom. But we're, we're going to figure it out. Um, we're going to figure out a way for Wayne and I to both appear on screen because we're so beautiful. <laughs> and we'll also have the slideshow that so uh i guess we'll, this will be part three because uh there's a lot you put together a really phenomenal presentation here that i uh i feel bad i wasn't oh, able to well, really, you know i think uh, it incorporate was... too well but we'll we'll do that next time uh because i think um a lot of people are really gonna really gonna dig what you put together it's uh really something special so anyhow uh this has been the secret sun video mystery hour wayne and i are going to have a little chat uh but i'm going to stop recording now and do check out opensanctum.substack.com i think all of you are going to find a lot of material worth diving into oh thank you all right let's